Uh, If you would turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 23, that's going to be our text this morning. Genesis 23, let me just uh, click on that. Maybe. There we go. We're going to read the text first, then we'll make some observations. There's 20 verses here, I want to read them all. As usual with Old Testament narrative, uh, you've usually got to read a little bit more to get... Uh, to capture everything uh, that is being said to make the point. So uh, we're going to go ahead and begin in verse 1 of Genesis 23, where it says, Now Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. Sarah died in Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Then Abraham rose from before his dead and spoke to the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner among you. Give me a burial site among you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The sons of, the sons of Heth answered Abraham, saying to him, Hear us, my lord. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our graves. None of us will refuse you his grave for burying your dead. So Abraham rose and bowed to the people of the land, the sons of Heth. And he spoke with them, saying, If it is your wish for me to bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, and approach Ephron, the son of Zohar, for me, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns, which is at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in in your presence uh, for a burial site. Now Ephron was sitting among the sons of Heth. And Ephron the Hittite answered, Abraham, in the hearing of the sons of Heth, even all who went in at the gate of the city, saying, No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the presence of the sons of my people, I give it to you, bury your dead. And Abraham bowed before the people of the land, and he spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, If only, if, if, if you will only please listen to me, I will give the price of the field. Accept it from me, that I may bury my dead from the... From the uh, Excuse me, that I may bury my dead there. Then Ephron answered Abraham, saying to him, My Lord, listen to me, a piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between me and you? So bury your dead. Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Heth. 400 shekels of silver, commercial standard. So Ephron's field, which was in Machpelah, which faced Mamre, the field and the cave which was in it, and all the trees which were in the field were within the confines of its border were deeded over to Abraham for possession in the presence of the sons of Heth before all who went into the gate of the city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah and his wife in the cave of the field at Machpelah, facing Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave that is in it were deeded over to Abraham for a burial site by the sons of Heth. And we're going to stop there. At first glance, There is not a tremendous amount that catches the eye in this chapter. But upon closer examination, we can see two events that have tremendous implications uh, to this present day. And the first is Sarah's death, which is recorded in verse 1. We see in verse 1 where it says, Now Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. Um, These kinds of death records were pretty commonplace in the Old Testament for men. However, Sarah is the only woman in, woman in the entire canon of Scripture to receive this type of distinction. Not even Mary, the mother of Jesus, received such honorable mention in the Scripture, although Mary is included in the genealogy of Jesus along with Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. Uh, but the significance here is that we are able to see God's heart towards women through these periodic breaks in cultural convention that we see from time to time in the Old Testament scriptures. We're able to see that it was never God's intention for women to be subordinated and devalued, and this would not be the case as the kingdom of God unfolded. The role of women in God's kingdom is a subject that we could be filling up an entire service with, maybe even two, uh, and that's really not what we're focused on this morning about, so we're going to skip past that subject, and we're going to focus upon the other event from here on uh, that's in the text. And the second event is Abraham's purchase of the cave of Machpelah from the sons of Heth to serve as a burial site for Sarah. 
and eventually for the rest of his family. And we see that in verses 2 through 20. This second event is the primary focus of the chapter. Of the 20 verses that this chapter has, only three verses are really devoted to Sarah's death. The remaining 17 verses are devoted to covering this real estate transaction with the most stringent and, I would argue, mind-numbing detail. Um, and here's what I mean. If we were to go over the breakdown again um, in verses 3 through 6, Abraham seeks permission from the sons of Heth to set up a grave site among them. It's much like going to the township for a zoning request or something like that. Then he goes to Ephron, the Hittite specifically, to, t- to determine his willingness to sell the property. Then he negotiates the purchase of the property with Ephron, the Hittite. Then he weighs out the price agreed upon between them, then the cave of Machpelah and the field surrounding it was deeded over to him, and all this was done in front of the sons of Heth so that it was witnessed and legitimized. And as we look at this text, and as we read through this text, do you ever kind of get the feeling like you're reading the minutes to a board meeting? You know what I'm saying? You're just, it's just very, it's very legal. It's very methodical. It's like, ugh, you know. As I was reading through this, where you're saying to yourself, boy, this is going to be a real snoozer today. This is going to be a rough one. We'll do our best to stay awake. And I can tell if you're sleeping. But what was happening here, in reality, is that this chapter takes this form for a very specific and intentional reason. Because it was a binding legal action that was permanent in nature and eternal in significance. Uh, What was Abraham doing here? I would argue, as we have up on the board, um, he was formally and eternally uh, switching his citizenship. I would argue the equivalent of what he's doing here is he's switching his citizenship. In buying the cave of Machpelah to serve as a burial site for his family, Abraham, again, was formally uh, changing his citizenship. If you were to imagine renouncing your American citizenship or Canadian citizenship or what other citizenship may be represented uh, by those who are watching this message and claiming citizenship to another country, uh, if you could imagine that, that would be close to what was happening here in this text. And that is why this chapter is presented so formally and so legally. Uh, the best way to understand and to grasp the, grasp the significance of this event, event is to explore the questions of how Abraham renounced his former citizenship and what Abraham claimed as his new citizenship. And so uh, our study is going to take that, um, that track. It's, uh, again, we're going to explore how Abraham renounced his former citizenship and what Abraham claimed as his new citizenship. And so let's start with the question of how. Um, Abraham renounced his old citizenship by declining to be buried with his country and kindred of origin. Again, he renounced his former citizenship by declining to be buried with his country and kindred of origin. Um, The way we understand burial today is significantly different uh, than the way burial was understood in the times that this text was written thousands of years ago. Today, burial is more about memorializing the life that a person led and gaining closure for the family that is still living. But in Old Testament times, it was about being eternally part of your homeland and of your people. By being buried with your kindred in your homeland, you lived on as long as they lived on. That was the way they conceptualized eternal life. And this is why we often see a good death in the Old Testament described as this person being gathered to his people or this person sleeping with his fathers. Do you guys ever see that terminology used as you read through the Old Testament? He breathed his last and he was gathered to his people. He slept with his fathers. This is what a good death was in the Old Testament. And we can see this playing out in two basic, basic worldviews on burial that were present in the Old Testament, and I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, there are two worldviews that kind of solidify this for us in our minds. The first is that in Old Testament culture, burial uh, was a great priority. It was a priority uh, to be buried in the Old Testament. Um, it was of the utmost priority to those of the Old Testament times to be buried with their fathers in their homeland and the Old Testament repeatedly supports this idea. For example, um, Barzillai, I'm just going to give you a few of them, um, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Uh, he was somebody who was with David when David was fleeing from Absalom. But as David was heading back <clears throat> to Jerusalem to be restored as king after Absalom's conspiracy, 
um, he asked 84-year-old Barzillai to come to Jerusalem with him, and this was the response that he gave him in 2 Samuel 19.37. He said, please let your servant return so that I may die in my own city near the grave of my father and my mother. Let me go die with my family and be buried with my family. Really, really important to them. Um, Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, uh, is another example of this. During the seven-year famine, Jacob uh, called for his family to come to Egypt so that he could sustain them there. This is an, uh, an account that most of us are aware of. And Jacob was very troubled by this initially because it meant dying in a foreign land. And he gave strict instructions on his deathbed that his body was to be buried with his fathers in the cave of Machpelah that Abraham just purchased here. And I'm going to give you that uh, text now. When the time came for Israel to die, die drew near, he called his son Joseph and said to him, please, if I have found favor in your sight, place your hand under my thigh now and deal with me in kindness and faithfulness. Please do not bury me in Egypt, but when I lie down with my fathers, you shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I will do as you have said. And he said, swear to me. And he swore to him. And Israel bowed and worshiped on the head of his bed. Do you see how he's speaking to his son? And he said, whatever you do, swear to me that you will not bury me here. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that Abraham purchased. You see how important this was to Jacob? This was not a joke. He made his, in his last breaths, the last things he was saying to him was, bury me with my fathers. Joseph said something similar uh, to those around him. He gave similar instructions uh, and that his bones would not be left in Egypt, but they would be carried out when the nation left. And so we see that um, in Genesis 50. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will assuredly take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will assuredly take care of you and carry my bones up from here. Excuse me. God, God will assuredly take care of you, and, and you shall carry my bones up from here. Do you understand what he's saying there? He's saying, carry me out with you. Make sure, don't leave me here. When you leave, take me with you. I want to be buried there. And in this, you see the uh, priority that burial was with your family in your homeland. This was a very big deal to them. But the second worldview uh, that contrasts with this is that uh, no burial was a curse. No burial was a great curse in the Old Testament scriptures. Um, burial declared citizenship in a very permanent and binding and eternal way. And with this in mind, to be deprived of the opportunity to be buried in your homeland and with your people, again, was one of the worst forms of curse that you could experience. Today, it's not common to, for people to be cremated and have their ashes scattered about. But then, to be scattered about in that way was like going into the afterlife eternally disowned. That's really what it was like for them. That was the way they conceptualized it. Uh, for your body to, to fail to receive proper burial was the closest thing to hell that Old Testament people could envision. And this is also reflected multiple times throughout the scriptures. Uh, this is what was meant by all the imagery of dead bodies lying on the ground being eaten by beasts of the earth in the Old Testament. And I could give you lots of examples of this um, in, Jer in the book of Jeremiah, but I'm going to give you uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 25 and 26, where it says, The Lord will cause you to be defeated by your enemies, and you will go out one way against them, but you will flee seven ways from their presence, and you will be an example of terror. To all the kingdoms of the earth, your dead bodies will serve as food for the birds of the sky and for the animals of the earth, and there will be no one to frighten them away. Not only are you going to die, but your corpse is going to be left on the ground and birds are going to eat it. You're not even going to be buried. It sounds gross. I know, I know it sounds gross. This imagery appears, appears a lot of times in the book of Jeremiah as well. What are they trying to say? It is the worst form of death. It is kind of like, it is the closest thing to conceptualizing hell or damnation or just being eternally disowned. It, it's a very ugly thing and terrible thing for them. And for this reason, it's no coincidence that this was the fate of the infamous Queen Jezebel in 2 Kings chapter 9. And I'm going to try to put that text up on the board for you now, where it says, Then he said, and by the way, he is Jehu, uh, who was uh, dealing with, uh, he was purging Israel from Ahab's uh, reign. Jehu said, Throw her down. So they threw her down. And some of her blood splattered on the wall and on the horses, and he trampled her underfoot. And then he came in and ate and drank. 
And he said, See now to this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. So they went to bury her, but they found nothing of her except the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. And therefore they returned and informed him. And he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, On the property of Jezreel the dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the corpse of Jezebel will be like dung on the face of the field in the property of Jezreel, so they cannot say this is Jezebel. Uh, Note, I mean, again, it's gruesome, but we're making a point here to understand just how awful it was in Old Testament times for a person not to be buried. Uh, Note that despite her wickedness, Jehu was going to bury her. He's like, she's a, she's a king's daughter. A king, you know, uh, we need to bury this woman. But because of her status, you know, as, as a queen, he was going to do that. But God saw to it that her body was consumed before Jehu could get to her. Um, and again, to kind of communicate the idea of just how wicked she was. Uh, this understanding of burial gives some context also to the actions of the men of Jabesh Gilead in response to hearing the fate of Saul and his sons. One of the more interesting Old Testament passages on this, I think, is 1 Samuel 31. It's long enough that I'm not going to put it up on the board. If you wouldn't mind turning there, this is 1 Samuel 31, verse 8. If if you're quick, you want to turn there. I'm just going to go ahead and read it. But if you're taking note, you want to go back and look at this later. It's 1 Samuel 31, beginning in verse 8. It came about on the next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. They cut off his head and stripped off his weapons and sent them throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to the house of their idols and to the people. They put his weapons in the temple of Ashtoreth and they fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shan. Now, when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men rose and walked all night. And they took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the, from the wall of Beth Shan, and they came to Jabesh and burned them there. And they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. Do you ever read that passage of scripture and wonder why the men of Jabesh Gilead marched all night into enemy territory at great hazard to their lives to retrieve the body of Saul and his sons for burial? The reason is because allowing them to hang there under rot was a, the equivalent of them going into eternal, going basically being eternally disowned, and they were not going to allow that to happen. Um, Jabesh Gilead is an interesting place because, um, in the beginning, um, when Saul was uh, ascending to the kingdom, uh, they were uh, they were oppressed uh, and they were under siege and there was a an oppressor there. I think it was Nahash the Ammonite was his name. It was First Samuel 11 that he was he was going to take the city and he told them surrender and pluck out one of your eyes and you know we'll let you live and stuff. And Saul was the one that rescued them in the very beginning. And for the, and this was like 40 years ago, uh, but in this particular case, uh, when this had happened to Saul and his sons. Those men remembered what Saul did for them years ago, and they went and rescued his body and buried him. And, and it was their way of saying, you are honorary citizens of our land. Uh, and they gave him a place to be buried. And uh, again, the idea was, here was is that burial was very important for them. With all this in mind, by buying the cave of Machpelah in Canaan as a burial site for his family, rather than taking Sarah back to Paddan Aram and starting a burial plot there, Abraham was formally renouncing the home and the people of his birth in the most binding and most eternal way that people understood. Do you understand what I'm saying? He came from Paddan Aram. He came from a different place. He'd been living out here his whole life. And by doing this, by buying this burial plot here, um, he was renouncing in a very formal way his citizenship to that homeland. And he was placing it somewhere else. This was very radical. This was as radical an act as one could take. Uh, But I want to deal with the question now for a few minutes of what Abraham claimed as his new new citizenship because we were seeing that he renounced his old citizenship. But what makes this even more astounding is when we consider what he claimed as his new citizenship. It was not simply the renouncing of his home that made this act so astounding. 
Abraham is not the only person who ever changed the citizenship in this way. It happened often enough in this culture. What makes this act so unique is what he claimed as his new homeland and his new people. Uh, and here it is. Abraham claimed new citizenship to a land that was not yet his and to a people that did not yet exist. You follow me? Not only did he renounce his former citizenship, but he claimed new citizenship to a land that wasn't his yet and to a people that didn't exist yet. At the time Abraham made this move, there was no Israelite nation or people, and the land he was claiming for his citizenship was occupied by the Canaanites. He had to buy a field from them. You know, this was not his land. God had promised it to be his land, but it wasn't yet. And God had promised a nation from his descendants, but that hadn't happened yet. This was all done in faith. Uh, it, ha it didn't exist yet. Changes of citizenship are relatively common. And it's easy enough to conceptualize today. Um, we can think of it in term of, terms of exchanging our citizenship from one country to another country. But imagine renouncing your American citizenship or the citizenship of your birth, whatever it is, for citizenship in a country that doesn't exist yet, but will exist someday. You know, there's lots of countries out here. We can switch one to another. But imagine renouncing your American citizenship or whatever and saying, I'm going to declare citizenship to a place that isn't here yet, but will be someday. Imagine explaining this to your family. Imagine if one of your kids came up to you and says, you know what, I'm going to renounce my citizenship and claim citizenship in this land that doesn't exist yet. Would you think they were nuts? Would you try to talk them out of it? Would you think that they lost their mind? This is exactly what Abraham was doing here. This is what he was doing all along. He had been living this reality his whole life since God's initial call. And just to remind you what his initial call was, we see that in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. That's here. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you and I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and you will be uh, and and in you will all the families of the earth be blessed excuse me he has this was the call that he left under year decades and decades and decades ago and he had lived it his whole life and now, after 50 plus years, uh, well, nowhere as near being in possession of this promise, uh, Abraham, again, was still a foreigner in Canaan, Canaan, and Isaac was the only descendant that he had born to him very late in life. Abraham is still making this claim of citizenship to the land that God promised him, eternally permanent. Basically, he's betting his eternal destiny on it. He's going all in, shoving all of his chips in right here, going all in. He would betted his life on this, and now he's betting his eternity on it. And that's what he's doing here. It's really profound when you think about it. And it's kind of insane to those looking on in the time. But as insane as it might seem, this is exactly what saving faith looks like. This is how saving faith works. This change of citizenship is an action that all of us must take in order to become children of God. We have to change our citizenship to the kingdom of God become children of God. And this is why true believers are called children of Abraham in the New Testament scriptures. I'm going to give you Galatians chapter 3 and verse 6, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 7, there's verse 6 as well. Uh, Just as Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, therefore recognize that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The, the, the idea that he was living in faith for a kingdom that had not come yet, well, in, that, in, in a world that belonged to someone else. We do something similar here, and when we do that, we are children of, Ab of Abraham following his example. True believers are those who, like Abraham, have renounced their worldly citizenship and claim citizenship in the kingdom of God that is to come. Again, another verse, Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything less than this is not saving faith at all. This is what it means to be saved. Now, just as Abraham was told that the Canaanites would one day be wiped out and replaced with his descendants, we are also promised by God that this old world system will one day be wiped out and a new eternal kingdom will be established to rule this world in its place. And those who are citizens of this present world establishment will be wiped out with it. 
like the Canaanites, but those who have already declared citizenship in God's kingdom will be forever part of it as it is introduced and established. So if you want salvation, if you desire eternal life, then you need to change your citizenship from this world to God's kingdom. And a decision to renounce your worldly citizenship and declare citizenship in Christ's kingdom is a radical decision to make. It is. It's radical. There's nothing simple. There's nothing safe. There's nothing incremental about it. It's kind of an all or nothing move. Nothing move. It's very, very serious. And it, it's serious for a couple of reasons. And I'm going to give those to you now. The first reason that this decision is radical and difficult is because this decision requires complete and total trust in God's word. In order to make this move, we must bet our lives, both present and future, on God's promise of a kingdom that, has, that is yet to come into full fruition. Again, we're betting on something that hasn't happened yet. And we're ordering our life. We're cashing everything in to live in that kingdom. It hasn't come into fruition yet. The earth is still in the hands of the fallen world system. But remember that Abraham was in the same boat. Canaan was still in the hands of the Canaanites. And the, nation, and the nation of his descendants was not yet in existence. All he had was God's promise. Yet he cashed everything in, in faith and in hope. He lived his whole life in faith and he cashed his eternity in in hope. But along with God's word, God's promise, God gave Abraham a very important token of his intentions. And I would argue that token of his intentions was Isaac. Abraham, Abraham did not yet have a nation of descendants, but he had Isaac, who was miraculously born of Sarah in her old age after a lifetime of barrenness. And God repeatedly told Abraham that the nation he promised would displace the Canaanites and take possession of the land. That nation would be called from Isaac's descendants. And in the same way, uh, we have to take God at his word in order to change our citizenship to God's kingdom, but we also have a very important token of God's intentions, and that person is Jesus, right? The Bible tells us that though the kingdom has not been fully established yet, the day is coming when Jesus and his saints will come and set things right and rule and reign forever. And Jesus' existence, his life, his death, his resurrection, all testify to the idea that God's promise is going to happen his kingdom is going to come. And just because it's not here yet doesn't change anything. It doesn't mean it's not coming. Um, just as God made Abraham's descendants a great nation and brought um, them to, into the land of Canaan in its time, uh, he's going to usher in the kingdom in his time as well. And we're going to enter that. And so we have to live in faith and confidence that God is going to keep his word. And those who do that bet their life on it here. They make decisions that invest in that kingdom at the expense of this kingdom now. Uh, we have the option to make decisions that will gain us wealth and power in this life. But we can't do that without um, turning our back on the future that is to come and focusing only on, on this temporal life that is here. Uh, we have to, in faith, uh, live for the next life in order to be able to inherit it. Um, the second reason this is radical, though, is that this decision requires a complete displacement from this world as we wait uh, for God's kingdom. Uh, what I mean to say here is that there is no such thing as a dual citizenship with both God's kingdom and this present world. You can't be citizens of both at the same time. If you want to be a citizen of God's kingdom, you must renounce your citizenship in this present world now, like Abraham did, in order to claim citizenship in the kingdom of God. And what this means is that we must live in this world displaced. It means that we're going to be out of step. It means that we're not going to really fit in here very well. It means that we're going to spend our entire lives in this present world as foreigners waiting for God's kingdom to come. And this is exactly, by the way, how the author of Hebrews describes Abraham's life in faith in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he left, not knowing where he was going. By faith he lived as a stranger in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. He lived his whole life as a sojourner in tents, 
It wasn't, it, he was a guest there as he waited for God to usher in his promise. And not surprisingly, Jesus warns everyone who seeks to follow him of this reality uh, that we're going to be out of step if we walk with him. And that's why he said the things that he did in Luke chapter 9 to those who sought to follow him. I'm just going to put those verses up on the board now. Um, in Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62, there are people that are seeking to follow him. And as they seek to follow him, this is what he says to them. As they were going on the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Why would he say something like that? You know, because this, the kingdom is of this world. His kingdom hadn't come yet, and so he was kind of out of step. Um, he was a foreigner here. And he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at my home. But Jesus said to him, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, He's saying, I have no home here. And he's telling them that in order to follow him, you have to cut your ties to your formal home. Uh, he, and he said so in such a radical way that he said, told them not to even turn back and say goodbye. And I know this is extreme language, but it's communicating the idea that following him is renouncing your citizenship in this world and embracing citizenship in a kingdom that has not come yet, which is going to cause them to be out of place. Our kingdom hasn't come to fruition yet. And if we live for that kingdom, a kingdom that has values that are in stark contrast to what's going on here, uh, we're going to look strange and we're going to be out of place. In God's kingdom, the first are last. In God's kingdom, the poor are rich. In God's kingdom, the servants are great. You know what I'm saying? Everything is weird. And if you live like that here, you're not going to make sense. All right? You're going to look weird, but, for, but it's even worse. Because in this world, loyalty is to your country above or against the other countries of the earth. My citizenship is in this country, and your citizenship is in that country. And maybe we can get along so long as it benefits me. But if it doesn't benefit me, I'm going to choose me over you. There's, there's antagonism, there's war, there's conflict constantly. But the kingdom of God is about redeeming all kingdoms that are fallen and bringing them all into the kingdom of God. It's about loving all nations. It's about preserving all nations. It's about bringing them all in. And in order for us to be in step with the kingdom of God, we have to have that same mindset now. How do we redeem them? How do we love them? America first, that, that is not, that's not a kingdom mindset. It's something different. But when we don't embrace that, we will be out of step with the world. And when we embrace, and when we don't embrace that, sometimes we will look worse than just odd. We will look like traitors or non-loyal or such things as that. And that's where persecution comes from in this life. Um, a lot of the persecution that you see over the centuries isn't so much about them, what they've preached. It's about them looking suspicious or disloyal or being perceived as a threat to their homeland and such things as that. That will happen if you embrace God's kingdom as above and beyond the country you live in now. And we're not saying don't to be disloyal to your country. We're not saying that at all. We're just saying Christians embrace God's kingdom above all. And God's kingdom is about bringing all nations in. So saving faith is more than praying a prayer at an altar call when you were, you know, young. How many times have we been to funerals or have we considered the life of, of people that we lost and someone said, well, I remember years ago they came and they prayed a prayer and they, they made a decision for Christ at that time. They may not have lived at all like that since, but they prayed the prayer so they're good. It's really, it really doesn't work that way. It is a life of faith where you make a decision and then you live your whole life in faith based upon that decision right up to the very end. That's how you cash things in. That's what Abraham did. And that's what exchanging your citizenship in this world to the kingdom of God looks like. It's not an easy thing. It does involve a decision, but it isn't just a one-time decision that you make one time in an altar call. It's a decision you make every day, day by day, to live over and over again. Again, that's why Abraham was such a great example, because every day he chose to stay there. 
in faith. And even though everything God promised him didn't come into fruition yet, he stayed there and even made his grave there and he made his eternal citizenship there so that he could stay there where God promised things would happen. That's what it means to live in faith. God's kingdom is coming. We may not see it now, but it's coming. And may God help us to orient our lives towards his coming kingdom in a similar manner to the way that Abraham did. And with that being said, let's pray at this time.